It is such a pleasure to meet you all. Um, the lecture was not really planned long in advance, but I am so excited to be here for the first time. And I hope I don't disappoint you, because many of you know my brother Nuru. <laughs> and our personalities are like night and day. But alhamdulillah, it is truly an honor to be able to meet and share the little that I've learned on my journey through life with you, alhamdulillah. Now, I just want to get a quick survey. How many are married right now? Just raise your hands. <laughs> He's looking at his brother. <laughs> just two here and the ladies. All right. And how many are planning to get married soon, inshallah? Not sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, I will try and make sure that I carry everybody along. Um, if you're not yet married, well, like you are in the best place you could possibly wish you could be right now, because this is where you have a chance to hopefully prevent the pitfalls that are out there when you want to navigate marriage. Now, the thing about marriage and parenting and nurturing a beautiful home is there is no one size formula that fits everyone. What works for me may not work for you, but the good thing is there are best practices that many have used that have helped them make their marriage work and make their families thrive. And I will share what worked for my husband and I. Now, I came from a background that I would share to be so beautiful. I grew up in a home where we saw so much love, so much laughter, so much happiness. We were a very, very close-knit home. Literally growing up, my mother would be sometimes cooking in the kitchen, my dad would join, if she's singing, he sings, and before you know, we are all singing, then somebody grabs someone and we start dancing in the kitchen. We really were such a happy family. And alhamdulillah, my parents, they modeled good Islamic conduct, for, and they taught my brother and I Islamic values as well. And there was this very strong emphasis growing up on being disciplined, having good manners, good adab, and service, being useful. My parents, alhamdulillah, Allah yarhamu, were tremendous role models to the ummah, and they made such a huge impact before Allah called them home. Now, little did I know that the things that I was witnessing in the home, in the relationship between my parents, would actually come in useful in how I related with my husband and with my children and how we are nurturing our own little home. Now, many get married, and have children and just go with the flow, wherever it'll take them. Many just simply get married, start popping kids like rabbits, and just go with the flow, wherever the marriage will take them. Now, there is this quote that I love that goes, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. If you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. Why? Because, well, it doesn't matter where you end up. It doesn't matter where that there is. You didn't have plans. So if your marriage doesn't go according to plan, well, you didn't have plans for your marriage anyway. And if your children don't grow up the way you had hoped, if you didn't have plans for how you wanted to raise your children, then any road will take you there. So for us to build our own little Jannah in our homes, we have to know that it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of intentionality and effort on our part. For us to have a great, healthy, fulfilling relationship with our spouse and our children, it's going to take a lot of work to raise children that are not only God conscious that they have taqwa, but are also useful to themselves and to society. It requires us to be very intentional, very deliberate and committed. And this commitment requires both parties, both parties being on the same page. And to achieve that goal, we need a whole lot of prayers to go along with us. 
Now, due to time, I'm only going to be covering three main areas that I believe will give you the perfect foundation to build a beautiful home, have a little Jannah in your home. Number one is going to be our relationship with our spouse, because that is the foundation of any relationship. If you're in a marriage, then your relationship with your spouse is the beginning. If you get that right, then inshallah, you now go to the next one, which is our relationship with our children. And if we can get that right, then our extended families, our loved ones. Now, a beautiful marriage requires a true partnership. A beautiful marriage requires a true partnership. Ideally, both couples fully involved and committed to the success of each other, the success of the marriage, and the success of the home. If you see a home that is dysfunctional, it means one person isn't on board or both are not on track. So this is so important that both couples have to be committed to the success of themselves and each other, the success of the relationship, the marriage, and the success of building a beautiful home. But sadly, the reality for so many, it's quite different. The reality in many homes is that many have not seen what a beautiful home is meant to look like. Unfortunately, many have not seen what a beautiful relationship is meant to look like. So how can you build what you have never seen, what you've never experienced? It's very, very hard. But don't despair, there is hope, inshallah. Now, I was privileged, alhamdulillah, to see a beautiful love story in my parents for 50 years until Allah called my mother home. Now, when my husband and I got married, oh, we were so in love. My heart would skip a beat every time he called. And my stomach, I would feel this heat inside my stomach. When I'm not expecting his call and I see it, I just feel this, un it feels uncomfortable, but it feels so good. And I would replay our conversations over and over again. And I would practice the next one in front of the mirror. How many of you have ever experienced that? Please don't tell me it's just me. <laughs> Nobody wants to admit, right? <laughs> um, but he would write me the most beautiful, long, delicious love stories, love letters. But they were like a story. He would write a novel. Some would be 8, 10, 15 pages long. He would also record songs that captured exactly what he thought about me, how he felt towards me. You guys are supposed to say, oh, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> now, having seen such a beautiful relationship in my parents, of course, I felt that ours would even be far better than what my parents went through, because I felt theirs is old school kind of love. Ours is real, fresh, updated, reloaded kind of love. We were passionately in love. And then guess what? We went and spoilt everything by getting married. Yes, that beautiful, euphoric feeling we had beforehand, we now messed it up and went and got married. We had our first fight two weeks after we got married. Because I had never witnessed my parents quarrel, argue, disagree or fight, wallahi, I panicked. I literally freaked out because I'd never seen couples fight. I didn't know couples fight. And I was very stupid when I got married. I was 18 when I got married and very naive. And before you know it, I panicked. And I said, I can tell this marriage is going nowhere. We're fighting two weeks into the marriage. Said, I want a divorce. Yes, I know. You can say it. She's very stupid. I was. <laughs> So two weeks into the marriage, I asked for a divorce, and that wasn't nice. My husband was shocked, like, what? You know, what's wrong with her? Two weeks, literally, and she's asking for a divorce. So I was a drama queen, as you can tell. So what I didn't understand is what happened to those sweet nothings that he was telling me, all those love songs that expressed how he felt towards me. What happened to all that? We were meant to be honeymooning, and then instead, Things just suddenly changed. We now went from that beautiful state of love to what I felt as heat initially that was coming from my stomach started to spew molten lava. I started to get very angry, and I didn't know how to fight, so I didn't fight fair. I literally used what I call my greatest weapon of mass destruction, my mouth, and I went for blood. I would say whatever comes to my mind, unfiltered, 
unfortunately, that of course affected the relationship in a very negative way. Sadly, we fought for almost six years. Yes, I know, right? Some of you will say, I'm not sure if I want to get into this marriage thing. <laughs> Inshallah, after this, your story will be totally different. It's going to be much better. But we fought for almost six years. We went through a roller coaster of emotions love, hate, passion, disgust, disappointment, sadness, regret. Literally, those emotions went through. Sometimes the love would come up again, but it quickly got died down. It died down quickly because we were not fighting fair. We had not resolved and agreed on where we wanted the marriage to go. Now, how many who are married can relate to some of the things I've shared right now? The disappointment. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> now, unfortunately, and the reality for so many, is what Saeed and I went through in our years, early years of marriage, is a reality for many couples. For some, sadly, it can even be far worse. They go through bad, nice, nasty fights. There's disrespect. There's shouting. There's putting someone down. A spouse can feel trapped in a relationship, can feel broken, because the words that come out of your spouse's mouth can break you, or the ones you use on your spouse. They dissect you. There can be emotional, physical, economical, sexual damage done and abuse. There can be contempt in some relationship. Again, using the word disgust, you feel betrayed. So much infidelity in marriages today. There's manipulation, games playing. There's this struggle for power where one spouse wants to show off that I'm stronger than you economically. Maybe I come from a wealthier background. Or someone wants to show off intellectual superiority or financial superiority. Sadly, the reality in many homes today is couples live like roommates. Couples are living together, but more like roommates. They have given up on the relationship. They have no expectations for that relationship. And the list can go on. How many have heard this as a reality of marriages today? Just raise your hands if you've heard this as a reality. To be very honest with you, I'm so afraid of asking newlyweds, so how is married life? Now, I attend a lot of lectures, and I get invited to a lot of weddings to speak. And I sometimes go to these bling bling elaborate weddings, and I look at what they have spent on the event itself. And then, soon afterwards, I ask the couple, so how is married life? And guess what? You just see this face of, ah, it's OK definitely very different from what they look like on that wedding day. And unfortunately, it's not restricted to newlyweds. I talk to couples five years, 10 years, 20 years and more who have been married, and you ask, so how is marriage? How is married life? How is marriage treating you? And you see the same reaction. They're just managing themselves in the marriage. Again, just like roommates. Now, if Allah has described marriage in the Quran with words, such as love and mercy, muwadda wa rahma. And he has said, we are meant to dwell in tranquility and lounge in peace, happiness, and contentment in marriage. And nowhere did he say that we're meant to manage one another. Nowhere did he say marriage is self-sacrifice. Because a lot of people simply say, oh, I stay because of my children. Nowhere are we meant to suffer in marriage when some in marriage today are being oppressed. And in Islam, oppression is worse than slaughter. And yet this is what we are going through when Allah says he has put love and mercy in our hearts. So why is it so hard? Why are so many miserable and suffering and feeling trapped in marriage? Why are so many marriages not working compared to those that are working? And why are some couples 110% committed while others are not. Now, how did things get so bad? Who can share with me in their honest opinion? What do you think is the reason why marriages are failing so fast today? Anybody, just share what your thoughts are, randomly. Who can share? Who said that? Expectations, absolutely. That's very, very true. Expectations. Like me, I expected marriage would be perfect. And of course, marriage is what you make of it. You work for your marriage. Expectations sometimes set us up for failure, because I thought mine would be as beautiful as my parents. Who else can share what they believe is the reason why marriages are not working today? 
No common goals, exactly. Because like I said, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. You don't have shared goals. The gentleman, yes, sir. Exactly. Because Allah has a compass, a personal qibla for us in marriage. And holding on tight to Allah's rope in a relationship is so critical. So the lack of taqwa, the lack of trust in Allah in the relationship to be our guide and our personal qibla. Excellent. Any other points that anyone wants to share as to why they believe marriages are not working today? Anybody else? Yes. Not willing to make some sacrifices in the marriage which is about give and take. It's about at least knowing you're not perfect. Excellent. Well, my husband and I have been counseling couples for over 20 years. And the cases of dysfunction in marriages and dysfunction in the homes is at an all-time all high. And the divorce rate in the Ummah, literally around the world, is at an all-time high. The peak happened during lockdown. Because for almost the two-year period and at least a year where many were stuck and confined in the homes, they were forced to be a family. No more, oh, I'm stuck at work, or I got to run and have a meeting with this person. No, you're with your family. Wallahi, that was when we counseled the couples the most and marriages fell apart because couples were no longer able to cope with what real marriage is meant to be like. Today, what you find is so many couples are dropping the ball. One partner is doing all the work while the other one is doing nothing. One partner is the one fighting to make the marriage work, putting in all the effort. Sometimes you find one partner is almost like a single parent, as if the other spouse doesn't exist in the relationship, because they're the ones doing everything to raise the children with the right values. Whatever the state of your relationship is now, and for those who are yet to get married, this is so important. It is so important that you ask yourself some critical questions. All right? And do not lose sight of this. Number one, the question if you're already married is, why did you get married in the first place? That's the first question. If you're not yet married, why do I want to get married? What is your goal? Why do you want to get married? If you are married, what were your spouse's endearing qualities? What did you fall in love with? What were their virtues that you loved? If you're not yet married, then make sure you look out for their qualities and never forget them. Those things you fell in love with. Why? When you start to fight, you start to forget all the good in your spouse. You start to completely find that gets blurry and as if that person didn't exist. But that beautiful person you felt in, fell in love with is still there. Just something made them disappear. Then what kind of home did you hope to build and nurture? That's another question you need to ask for those who are yet to get married. What kind of home do I want to build and nurture? And then what state of mind, what emotions did you want to have when you get married? Do you honestly feel you have attained that goal for those who are married now? Do you honestly feel you've achieved that thing you wanted to achieve when you got married? Do you look forward to coming home to your spouse? I ask those who are yet to get married to always remember this question. Continue to ask yourself if you look forward to coming home to your spouse because that's a litmus test as to whether you've been able to build a beautiful home. And that should always be your goal. Let me be eager. Let me be longing to come to this sanctuary that we've been able to build together. So if you are already married, ask yourself, do I look forward to coming home to my spouse and my children? That's an important question. Now, these questions help you reflect and assess the state of your marriage today. And if the answers to the questions are, yes, I look forward to coming home, say alhamdulillah. But Yes, <laughs> but my father always says, improve upon it. Because Rasulullah sallallahu method is ihsan and itkan. Perfection and excellence in everything we do. So again, perfect your marriage. Push for excellence in everything you do in the marriage. And if the answer is no, 
then maybe you are at where Saeed and I were six years into our marriage, where we had reached the lowest of the low. But I will tell you there is hope, and inshallah, I will share that with you. Now, Allah has prescribed marriage for us. Allah is the one who prescribed marriage for us. We didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, couples come together, do a nikah, give the mahir. No, 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 that's Allah's injunction. But as Muslims, we need to know, marriage is highly encouraged, but not compulsory in Islam. But it's highly encouraged to get married. Allah doesn't want you to get married to somebody who's useless, somebody who's a drunkard because he wants you to get married. No, of course, you're meant to select a good spouse. But even though it's not compulsory, it's highly encouraged. However, once we choose to get married and embark on this journey, shouldn't the first thing we do be to find out what does Allah want from us in that relationship? What are Allah's expectations of us in marriage? What are his rules? What are his rules? Because he prescribed it. So like my brother just mentioned, you know, this thing about following Allah's law of marriage, wallahi, is the key to your success in marriage. So why does Allah want us to get married? How many of us have done their homework? What are his guidelines? What does he expect from us, our behavior in that relationship? And what does marriage in Islam mean in Allah's eyes? What is marriage? We do our homework when we want to get a new job, right? If we apply for a job, before we go, we research the company we want to work for. We find out what are the best practices. We go through details to know what does that job entail? What does our employer expect of us? And how do we climb up the corporate ladder so that we will be the best in our jobs? Everybody wants that because if you impress your boss, you get a raise, you get promoted. You will be very successful. You will probably also do research on those who were there before you. Who were those who thrived? And what did they do to succeed? But guess what? We don't seem to want to do the same research for marriage. We want to know what our boss wants from us when we're going to apply for a job. But we don't seem to care what does Allah want from us in marriage. What does Allah ask of us? When we are going to be held accountable for what we did in that marriage or what we didn't do. Now just imagine, this is something we are going to have to answer to Allah for. So it's not compulsory, but guess what? Once you choose to tie that knot, then there are responsibilities on your head that you must fulfill. It's not an option. Now one thing is, we put all our energy in the wrong area. Things that aren't important. Guess what? If you want to get a driver's license, you will work hard, you will read, you will do everything to know the road rules. What are the rules? So you don't get in trouble. But again, when it comes to marriage, with Allah's rules, we just go with the flow, wherever it takes us. We don't do enough homework. We don't ask enough questions. People who are married, what are their best practices? People who have gotten divorced, what are your biggest regrets? We don't ask those questions. Then we work hard to make sure we want to impress our boss, but we don't work hard. When you look at what we shared just now as the state of marriages today, wallahi, many never ever think about the fact that we need to do what we need to do to make sure we embrace our boss upstairs. What I find interesting is how so many of us take our religious rituals more importantly than we take marriage. Let me give you examples. Our prayers. We get to know what does Allah want from us? How do we stand when we are in prayer? What kind of mental state of mind are we meant to do even when we are doing our wudu? We want to know the rules because we want to perfect, again, ihsan and itkan in our ablution and in our salat. How do we stand? How do we prostrate? Where do we put our hands? We get the nitty-gritty of those. Fasting, again, we want the maximum reward from our fast. So our niya, and in that state of mind when we are fasting, we are in constant remembrance of Allah. Again, we do our homework so we get the most bonus points, jannah points, for our fasting. We do sadaqah, we do the right intention. The non-obligatory, the nawafils, the zikr, and all those things, we try to make sure we know how to get the maximum reward from it. When we memorize the Qur'an, we make sure we pronounce so perfectly. We perfect every single letter that we say. Don't get me wrong, everything I've shared is so important. But guess what? Fulfilling our obligations to our spouse in marriage fulfills half of our ibadah. 
By the time you pack the salat, the nawafils, the zakat, the hajj, and all those non-obligatory and the obligatory put together, they constitute half of our ibadah. Marriage constitutes the other half. Can you imagine? And not just the act of the nikah, but the act of fulfilling our obligations is what gives us this other half. Imagine that's the part that is most neglected by people who get married. For me, I was appalled. People who had been married five, 10, wallahi, even 50 years don't know what their rights and obligations are in marriage. And they've been married that long and they are not fulfilling it. And they're going to have to answer to Allah for it. That was a huge revelation for me and very, very disturbing. You would think that is what everybody would be rushing to do, is to know what does Allah expect of me in marriage? How do I perfect my marriage? What are Allah's expectations? And what am I owing my spouse? And what does my spouse owe me? So that we talk about it before the marriage and make sure we understand it clearly. Allah blesses the union of couples who fulfill rights and obligations. You want to look at a marriage and you say, this marriage seems to be thriving. This marriage is successful. Go back and look, do your homework. Most likely they are fulfilling their obligations. Allah puts his stamp of, on approval on it. Because when you fulfill your obligations to your spouse, right there is a foundation for a happy home, a happy spouse. And a happy spouse means a happy couple, which means a happy home, which means happy kids. It just has a domino effect, which means a better society. I mean, it just always is everything good. Is there any reward for good better than other than good? Allah just keeps blessing it. So regardless of if you've been married or you're not yet married, or if you've been married 50 years, the first advice I would give you to build a happy, your own Jannah in your home is know your rights and obligations and fulfill them. Know your rights and obligation and fulfill them. And ignorance is not an excuse. That is the reality, especially now all of you who have heard it. You can't leave and say, I didn't know. I have shared because of how many don't know rights and obligations. If you visit my website, mariamlemu.com, I have a free printable PDF that I've put together by scholars, including my brother Nuru Lemu, who has shared also additional things in there that you can download free of charge. And you have an opportunity to start doing more homework. So that is the beginning. And inshallah, inshallah, I can promise you that if you start your relationship with fulfilling your obligations to each other, wallahi, you have the foundation. Wallahi, you have the foundation for a happy home. I often tell people there is no miracle lecture, no miracle anything that will fix your marriage, not a prayer, not a dua, not a fast that will fix your marriage if you don't tie your camel. And what do I mean by that? Of course, we know the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He told this man who wanted to release his camel, he said, tie your camel, then pray to Allah. You need to tie your camel, and then inshallah, Allah will take care of the rest. Tie your camel by fulfilling your obligations and by changing what lies within you because you know you are not perfect. And as long as you mentally have the humility to agree that I'm a work in progress, I will continue to evolve and upgrade myself, be better so I can do better in the relationship. Inshallah, Allah will put his stamp of approval on it. For those who are truly ready to make their marriages work, who are ready to make some sacrifices, make some changes and are committed, wallahi, you'll see the results. And it's again, the next thing I want to go to because we've talked about the marriage part, is the children. But before I go into children, I want to find out, does anyone have questions or need clarification on what I've shared so far? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Fulfilling? Being conscious of our iman and improving our iman. It's part of Ibadah. Iman, Iman is definitely one of the five pillars. Yes. Uh, for instance, if uh, concerning Ibadah, because the conflict with concerning Ibadah is uh, a very strong uh, so thing in Ibadah. So, what, what do we prioritize about that issue? Explain your question a bit better, sorry. Uh, like sometimes, like, we want to do Ibadah more. Yes. But our spouse is just at home. Ah, so very good question. Excellent question. Everything in Islam is about balance. 
like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was moderate. When it came to how much time he gave Allah, he gave also plenty of time to his family. It was about balance. So priorities when it came to even his dawah, even his family were witnesses that he took care of his family after his prayer. But most of the people yes. are Yeah. To the extreme doing da'wah, neglecting their family, to be very honest, that is not proper, if you ask me. Because Rasulullah's way was to make sure if he is at home, he takes care of his family after his ibadah. That is his relationship with Allah. But even that was in moderation, not at the cost of ignoring his spouse or his children. It was balanced. So everything should be done. Anything that is extreme is not good. Water is good for us, but too much is not good. Food is good, but too much. You know, everything is in moderation. You do your ibadah and you, your family falls apart. You ignore your children because you're busy doing da'wah and they end up on drugs. Who do you blame? You have to balance it. You can't say, I left my spouse to be in charge. Parenting is two. And Allah will ask you because you were part of creating that child with Allah's blessing. So you can't ever say, this is it. What I believe strongly, because like I have a case in point of someone very close to me who got married to someone who was also committed like him to the da'wah. So they would do it together. So if you have a partner, yeah, then you know, you know what? Before marriage, we can talk about that. That this is my life. This is my true calling. This is what gives me meaning. This is what makes me feel, look forward to waking up in the morning. Are you ready to join me on this journey? She says, yes, you now talk about it. However, you also then plan with your children. Like my husband and I, we sacrificed so much when we finally decided to have kids. Number one, my husband made it clear to me. He says, Mariam, you're not ready to have children. He said that to me. I was 18 and I was very stubborn and very immature. With societal pressure and everything. I just wasn't ready to be a mother. And he knew how important my role to, as a mother was going to be that he says, you're not yet ready. You're not yet mother material. He says, but I'm not yet re ready to be a father. He says, I have baggage. My husband, because I come from Nigeria, polygamy is very common. My husband's the eldest of 26 children. Yes. And his father married a total of seven women before he died. Not all at once. So you can imagine... He came from a more dysfunctional background, and he hated what he witnessed. And it affected him psychologically and in so many ways. It's permitted. Oh, no, the polygamy is allowed. So it's not that, but what he went through as a child in the polygamy, because his father was absent. He was in politics. And here is this boy at 12 having to settle fights that, or between mothers. Who were, he was caught in the crossfire. So as he grew up, he had some excess baggage, which he needed to deal with and heal. He said, so Mariam, I'm not ready to be a father till I know I've dealt with the things that make me angry, the issues that are bothering me, till I bury and address my wounds. So we waited six years before we reached the stage where we both felt we were ready to have kids. Alhamdulillah. And it was with Allah's blessing. But again, if you both choose to go down the path of da'wah, Sorry, and so by the time our kids actually came, we now sacrificed a lot of things so that we could dedicate it to raising them to the best of our ability. Because why? I'm going to go into why that is such a sensitive thing. So if you do da'wah, fine. You have children and you leave them for someone else to raise, Allah will ask you. So you need to know the dangers of that. And I'll go into that now. But it's a beautiful question you asked. What I often say is just make sure you have someone who's on the same page or someone who says, you know what, I got you, go ahead. Who agrees to sign up for that, that's fine. Yes, excellent question. Anybody else have a question on what we've covered so far? Are we good? Was it clear? Alhamdulillah. All right. Now, just like marriage, it's not compulsory to have children, just like marriage, but it's highly encouraged for the propagation, the continuity of the ummah, it's highly encouraged for us to have kids. But our children didn't choose us to be their parents. Allah chose us to be their parents. But they didn't ask to be born, we chose to have them with Allah's blessing. They are a gift to us from Allah, but we can also be a gift to them and a trial. 
They are a gift to us, but they can also be a trial. But we are also a gift to them, but we can also be their trial. I love what Mufti Menk said, Ismail Mufti Menk. You're familiar with the scholar? And he said that, yes, paradise lies under the mother's feet, and parents are the gate, the key to Jannah for their children. However, our children are also the keys to Jahannama if we don't do it right. And I love the day he said that, because we parents need to understand what we are signing up for. So did we have plans for when and how we want to have the kids, what we want to raise, what we want to instill in them, what values? Are we conscious? This is the most dangerous part. Are we conscious of our behaviors that they will replicate, good, bad, or ugly? Are we conscious of that? What seeds are we planting in our children? What gifts are we giving them? Seeds and gifts of a good tarbiya. Alhamdulillah, I love the name of the organization here, and I saw the word tarbiya, and I said, this is so important. What seeds and gifts are we giving our children of a good tarbiya? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, one of the best gifts we can give our children is good tarbiya and a good education, good upbringing. Good upbringing and a good education. Why? Because it means the ummah will continue. It means the goodness will continue if you raise your children well. Gifts, many of us, the best gift we can give our children is to send them to the best school, academic excellence. But what gifts are we, gi are we giving our children beyond academic excellence, beyond just A-class students to A-class human beings? For me, I think that is where we parents need to understand the weight on our shoulders. We have to recalibrate the way we see children. Many of us get married, nine months later, we start popping children like rabbits, and we don't press pause and understand the implications of what we are doing. Just as they will be called to account for how they took care of us in our old age, we will be called to account for how we raised our children. And if we fail at this parenting thing, if we drop the ball or neglect our responsibilities, we end up creating dysfunctional children. Children who grow up to be a problem to their spouse and their children. Children who grow up to be a menace to society. Today, if you think about all those who have terrorized people, caused pain, hurt people in history, they all had parents. What kind of upbringing did they have? That is such an important. People who have caused, committed terrible atrocities, they all had parents. What was their upbringing? What was the role of the person who delivered them? The worst part is, we get commission for any bad deeds our children do because we messed up. This was, wallahi, one of the scariest things that freaked me out. That if I don't raise my child properly and they go out to hurt others, and become a menace or dysfunctional in society, everything they do because of what I neglected, I get commissioned for it. I'm telling you, many people would not be so quick to pop kids <laughs> when they stop to reflect on this. If we didn't show them the right example, if we didn't raise them well, I feel so scared about this burden of being a parent and how important and how critical it is that we take our time before we become married, take our time, do the homework, what does Allah want, so we do that right. Before we become parents, we take our time, do our homework. But it's never too late, even if you rush to have kids. Well, lie, you can start, even today, even if you have children like this now. You can make a decision to say, you know what, I need to change, I didn't realize, and start from scratch. Many don't understand the implications of what they are signing up for, and they end up going with the flow. So it's not about just us as a couple, just me and you, my husband, and we love each other, no. It's about our relationship with our maker as well. So it's no longer just the two of us. We brought Allah to be a witness to our nikah, so we've signed a contract in the presence of Allah. And it's not just about us, it's about us and our maker. The same thing with our children. When we sign up to be parents, we're now signing a deal with Allah. We need to understand the implications. For some of us, our parents did a fantastic job raising us. We saw a great, healthy, beautiful example. They raised us in homes where we saw love, compassion, mutual growth, great communication, God consciousness. They taught us the importance of being useful and contributing to society. 
and living a meaningful life, living a life of purpose. If we were so fortunate, then it makes it so much easy for us to replicate and improve upon what our parents did. For some, and most, sadly, the reality is quite different. It's a different story. In some families, you see stories similar to those of some prophets, whose trials were their family members. Some of, the pro some of them, their problems were their parents. Well, life, for some parents, they make life miserable for their children. They are their children's trial. I went to the UK to do a premarital retreat. I'm passionate about anything to do with marriage and premarital. So I just, about two months ago, I was in Leicester, and I spent two weeks. And I was doing a workshop there for singles. And one of the things that disturbed me was when one of the volunteers, after I spoke about this thing to do with children and the importance of it and how parents are the ones damaging the children and what are the children witnessing in the home. I remember during the breaks, I get to counsel individuals or couples and she booked to for a counseling session with me. And when she sat down, she was just shaking and crying endlessly. And I couldn't, I tried so hard to comfort her. And I said, what's bothering you? She said, I'm scared because my children grew up seeing my husband and I fight terrible fights. And our children, one by one, kept running away from home because they could not live with the toxicity in the home, what they were witnessing. There was a lot of verbal abuse. At one point, she said it became physical abuse. We were fighting, me and my husband, physically, and our children grew up seeing that. One of them rushed to get married, but is divorced now. And he said he rushed to get married because he wanted to leave home. And she didn't know what she would say to Allah. She had only three children and all had left home. And she said, they, they don't want to come home to us. We are lonely. We had kids so that we would have people to look, out, look after us in our old age. Now our kids don't want to be near us because of what they witnessed and the damage we caused them. So for some, their parents are their problem, like Prophet Ibrahim. For others, their problems are their spouses, like Nuh, Ayub, and Lut, alayhi salam. For some, it's their children. For others, it's their uncles or aunts. We have to ensure that we are self-aware enough and emotionally intelligent enough to recognize how our backgrounds affect us. This is so important. We have to know and ensure that we do not replicate in our homes with our spouse and our children those things that we detested, those things that we resented growing up. We need to start becoming more self-aware that sometimes our parents drop the ball. Sometimes parents get it wrong. But what's important is we do not recycle history. That isn't pleasant. We have to also ensure that we do not allow our children to replicate our negative history. That means we need to be very conscious of what our children see in us. The key is to make sure that our guidance is our God consciousness, our taqwa, and the principles of our faith. If we follow that path, that Sarat al-Mustaqim, Allah makes it easy for us. And make sure we do not replicate other people's mistakes and shortcomings. We have to break the generational curse. We have to recognize and make sure as Muslims, we're never meant to be wit uh, uh, victims. As Muslims, we can never be victims. Everything happened to us for a reason, but recognize it and make sure you do not repeat it if it's not good. For us, parenting, parenting took a whole new meaning when we truly understood the verse in Surah Al-An'am, where Allah said, for he it is who has made you vicegerents. Not for he it is who will make you when you reach a level of taqwa, no. He said, for he it is who has made you vicegerents. Now, we are Allah's khalifas. And vicegerent, the word vicegerents has many meanings, more than one meaning. It means deputy, it means ambassador, it means representative, and it means successor. So Khalifa doesn't just have one meaning, a representative of Allah, an ambassador, also successor. Khalifa is the one who improves the world on behalf of Allah. As Allah's representative, our job is to improve the world on behalf of Allah. We are here to serve Allah as his representatives in all aspects of life. The way we think, we need to think, how, does Allah, how would Allah think if he were standing here now, here with us in this room? How would Allah be thinking? That's 
for me is the level I am taking this Takoa thing, this Khalifa thing, to say, when I speak to my sisters or my brothers, how do I speak in a way that is representing Allah well? Well, life takes on a totally different meaning when you start to break down and analyze this thing. The way I work and interact with people, my neighbors, non-Muslims, how am I representing Allah? The way I eat, even the way I fight, how do I fight the right way with good adab? Because as Muslims, even at battle, there are rules of engagement. Allah has rules of good etiquette. How we relate with others, every aspect of our life, it's to constantly think, how would Allah want me to behave as his ambassador? And also, we need to recognize that we are here to protect Allah's creation and ensure that we keep it good, if not better, for the next generation. Now, this is where it took on a different meaning for me. I see myself as a guardian of the universe. When I came across the word and the real meaning, other meanings of Khalifa as successor, it made me think deeply, successor. Now, that means every generation is inheriting from the next generation. So as a Khalifa, I'm also a successor. And I will have those who will succeed after me. Now, that changed the way I saw it. Just as we inherited Islam from Rasulullah how he related with Allah, how he related with his wives, how he related with his children, how he related with his grandchildren, his companions, his neighbors, his loved ones, his enemies, how he related with others. We are meant to copy his example as his Khalifa. We inherited it, so we were the successors but we will also have those who succeed us. So what examples are we passing on? I see it as if we are passing on a baton to the next generation. So what are we leaving behind? And are we leaving it better than the way we met it? In the farewell khutbah, the last sermon of Rasulullah he said, all those who listen to me, all those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and those to others as well. And it may be that the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me directly. Just imagine that he is hoping that generations after him, which to me is us here right now, know the deen better than the Sahaba. That is so disturbing when you think about the state of the Islam today. And you think, okay, some have really dropped the ball. How do I make sure it doesn't get dropped on my shift? For me, that's how I see Khalifa. I keep saying, not on my shift. I am not going to be the one that lets down this Islam. I am going to pass on that baton. How? In how I relate with people, how I relate with my spouse, how I relate with my children. So that they see the example of Rasulullah in me, in what I learned, and they know how to take it from there. But I push them. It can't an Ihsan. Be better than me. Push. And constantly push. And inshallah, we will achieve that goal. So whether we like it or not, whether we are ready or not, people are copying us. People are looking at us and are replicating what we are doing. That is us, even if you're not a parent. If you have younger siblings, you're co they're copying you. They're looking up to you. Your neighbors could be looking up to you. What are you wearing? They want to wear what you're wearing. If you move with a circle of friends, in no time you find people start dressing in a similar way. So whether we like it or not, whether we're ready or not, we are replicating and people are replicating what we are doing. The things we have, what we wear, how we relate with others. Are we aware of this and do we even care? It's really important you go within. This is the real jihad bin nafs, where you peel the layers and say, am I representing enough? And is my example worth emulating? Are we passing that baton over the right way? What are we doing to ensure that our family and the next generation see the Prophet's example in us and understand it better than the Sahaba? They get the message. Better than those who saw it live and direct. We have to start with ourselves. For me, that is the beginning. We talk about children, we want them to emulate us, but first we have to be right. Before we get married, we've got to be right. I often say, Mr. Right is looking for Miss Right. Miss Right is looking for Mr. Right. So you better be right so that you will attract the right kind of spouse. So, but we have to start. You cannot teach or share what you don't know, what you don't have. If you're not in order, it's very hard to get the world in order. It's hard to be that example. 
So if your moral compass is not facing the right Qibla, if you don't know your own deen well enough, what Allah wants from you as his representative, then what are you going to contribute and what are you going to model? Now that responsibility is for me, myself and I to work on me first. One thing that helped me in my home as a wife, as a parent and as a person, an individual, is I knew I had many shortcomings. Ooh. In fact, many, many shortcomings I had. And I recognized that if I wanted to be better in all my roles as a mother, as a wife, as a worker, as a representative of Allah, I needed to start within myself. When our relationship with Saeed had reached rock bottom in our sixth year of marriage, things had really gotten so bad. Wallahi, I wanted out. I actually wanted a divorce. What shocked me at that time was when Saeed said to me one day when he came home, he said, Mariam, you know what? I don't look forward to coming home to you. Ouch. I was like, what? You don't look forward to coming home to me, but you're the problem. It's so easy to point fingers, right? I was like, why wouldn't you want to come home to me? You're the one causing all the trouble. Oh, I was the one actually. But all this time, yes, we both had our issues. We both had our differences. But that was something that just shocked me. Like, you don't... So you mean I'm not... I, you're not the only problem. I also have a problem. I'm also a problem. So it was a huge wake-up call for me. That's when I had to open my eyes and say, okay, two wrongs can't make a right. Yes, I agree. He has issues that I'm having a problem with. But he also has a problem with me. I have a choice to start with myself and work on me. At least if I can get me in order, I can now start saying, well, now you're the problem. So that's where we started. At this point, we both had a choice to either call it quits or fight. Fight to make our marriage work. And we chose to fight. To not want to come back home for me, like how low could that get? Home. Home is meant to be the sanctuary. Home is meant to be the safe space. You want to build Jannah in your home, but you have this kraken waiting for you, breathing molten lava and fire each time. That's not a home. And that's not a home in Islam. So since I realized that we both had to work on ourselves, but I decided I would work on myself first, and that was the turning point. I started to do more introspect. I started to learn about self-awareness. Wallahi, if you haven't learned about self-awareness, I ask you, just go on YouTube, Google self-awareness. Go on TED Talks, watch self-awareness. Why? Because it gives you this 360 understanding of yourself, your weaknesses, your strengths, and how you interact with people. So learn about self-awareness. Learn about your bad habits. Be ready to dissect yourself because you are far from perfect. And then I said something that changed our whole relationship. I asked Saeed to give me feedback. I said, Saeed, things have really gotten so bad between us. And I realized I'm contributing to the problems. I'd like you to be brutally honest with me, but be kind. Don't break me down, but tell me the truth. What is it that I'm doing in the relationship that you don't like, that you want me to stop? What is it that I'm doing that you like, that you want me to continue? And what am I not doing at all that you want me to start? And I promise you that changed the whole relationship. Because to my surprise, he asked me to do the same. Now, when he was speaking, I had to keep my big mouth shut for the first time in my life and take down notes. It was very hard because I like to, but I like, oh, I loved making facial expressions. I was very animated. Like I said, I was a drama queen, but I went ahead and just took had the humility for once to just take notes. Some questions I would ask is just help me understand exactly what you mean. That was it, but not defensiveness. And then, like I said, he asked me to do the same. And it's not about me. I had to start telling myself it's about the beholder. They say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. I could look in the mirror and feel so beautiful. He may look at me and say, gosh, she's ugly. You know, it's about the beholder. He's my husband. If he doesn't like how I look, then it's important I adjust accordingly. I started to change my mind that it's about the beholder. It's about my spouse. What does he look forward to coming home to? He responded pos positively, alhamdulillah. I asked him, please remind me tactfully when I go off course. Whenever you see me derail, give me a signal. Like one of the things he said to me is, you talk too much. And it, I, I wanted to deny it, but it's true. 
So I said, whenever we go out and you see me talking too much, give me a signal. So we agreed on two signals. One was like this, where he would just use his hands as if to say, pull your brakes. Yeah. One would be he would just, because he might, I might be too fast, so he would just do like this, make his eyes look small, meaning, shh. Again, everything to do with it. So if you ever see me and Saeed and you see him do like this, he's flatting a fly. It's not telling me to shut up. So, and I know you're going to be staring. Is he winking at her? Did, was that hurt him telling her she's talking too much? <laughs> so I'll be watching you. Leave me alone. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, over the years, wallahi, we have evolved because Saeed did give me the signals and I gave him signals as well. And we both started to have such an open mind to accept that when he corrects me, he's not criticizing me. He's not condemning me. He's actually upgrading me. And that mindset changed. Today, bring it on. I keep telling people, please, criticize. I don't care. I can't take it personal anymore. I was sensitive before. When he said something, I'll say, but you do too. Like, it wasn't, I, immediately my wall goes up. Now, I was like, wow, I didn't realize that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, please continue to draw my attention to it. Now I eat it. I love feedback. So it's very hard. I'll be very honest with you. It's hard hearing the truth about yourself. It's the most humbling thing to hear that what you thought, what your perceptions were, were not a reality. So it's really important to learn. And like Saeed shared when he gives lectures to men about this, he says, you got to learn to hang your ego outside your house when it comes to accepting feedback, because our ego messes us up. So that was it. And have a genuine interest in making the relationship work. This is so critical. I still ask for feedback every six, four to six months. I would ask my husband, how can I make you happier? And I ask you newlyweds, trust me, this is a formula for success, I promise you. Inshallah, have the ability to constantly ask, how are we doing? Is there any area I should change? How can I make you happier? Is there anything I should work on? And alhamdulillah, each time Saeed does the same. Years later, after we had kids, they were around 12 years old, one by one. I would ask the older one, Salim, what are the most important lessons that mama has taught you? That was something I did with him. The same thing with my youngest son, Noreen. What are the most important lessons I have taught you? If I'm not here at the, anymore today, what will you remember me for? Why? Because it helped me know if I'm on track in planting the right seeds in my children, the values. Because why? Parents sometimes will be reading these things to their children, but they're not demonstrating it to them, and so they're not learning. We think we can talk, 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 and unfortunately, it's what they see they learn, not what we say to them. So I often ask, what of my qualities will you never forget? Again, focus on qualities focus on values, focus on morals, focus on tarbiya. What is it about your relationship, our relationship, that I would want, sorry, this is a, so I just remembered, it was another question I asked my children, aha, this was it. What is it about our relationship, me and your father, that you would want to repeat with your own spouse? That was another question that I asked the kids. And it was a few, they're about three years apart, when Noreen got to 12, I asked him, and I constantly, now they're in their 20s, and I ask them these questions from time to time. What is it you will never forget about me? But what is it in our relationship that you would want to also repeat? And I love the fact that, and I never asked them together, but the older one said, to be married to my best friend. That was something that really meant a lot to me because we are always laughing, always having fun. Not always, but yes, we have a lot of fun. We joke a lot. We play a lot. And then the younger one, who is more of the emotional one, he said, to have someone that cares for you so much. Someone that cares. Because the father calls me like six times a day just to check on me. How are you doing? How's your day going? They see that. So I love that as amongst many other things we got as feedback. And then I also asked, what is it that you would not want to repeat in your relationship, in what you saw in us? Because for us, that feedback helps us also make sure we change certain things that our children are seeing that's not healthy for them. Because we got to remember we are passing on the baton. We want to make sure it's something that's worth continuing. So what is it um, 
I got used to asking these questions, and for me, I ask you, please, these questions are really important. Ask yourself, in part of your introspect, am I a pleasure to be around? Am I good company? This is so important. And this is good generally as a rule for life. Some people, when they come in, they suck the oxygen out of the room because they're very negative. They only see the wrong side. You know, they see the darkness, gloom and doom. Are you the sunshine? Do you bring noor when you come into the room? I remember my son who said, I don't know if you know that song, Ain't No Sunshine When You're Gone. It's an old school song. One person knows it. It's an old school song. I remember one day my son was shouting that song, Ain't No Sunshine When You're Gone. <laughs> and I, so his father turned to him and was like, what am I? Darkness and clouds, <laughs> you say it's only mama that brings sunshine. Um, but this is something. And then another question to ask, is my presence felt in the home in a positive way? Is my presence felt in the home? Am I sufficiently grateful to Allah for what I have? Because that gratitude, that abundance gives you so much more. And will Allah be pleased with me? with what example I am setting in the home for the children and how I'm raising my kids, how I'm relating with my spouse. Will Allah be pleased with me? And then, would I want to have a spouse just like me? Would I want to live with someone just like me? Those things really help so much. And then, would I want a mother or a father like me? How are you in your parenting skills? And then, last question, would you want to come home to someone like you? Now, if Allah called me home today, I often ask myself this and I ask you, when you go into the business of parenting and for those who are already parents, are you comfortable that if Allah called you home today with your children replicating exactly what they're seeing in the home right now, are you okay with that? That's such an important question to ask yourself. Am I okay with what I'm modeling that if I die today, let my kids continue what I'm doing. I ask you to do the same because this introspect, this going within, makes you more emotionally intelligent, makes you more self-aware, and helps you continue to evolve and upgrade yourself. The answer to these kind of questions gave us a sense of direction in our relationship, and it helps us live each day deliberately, consciously and intentionally, guided by the goals we now have for our marriage, because we had to have goals for our marriage, we have to have goals for our children, what we want to raise them with. We are on a mission to make our home a sanctuary, our own little slice of Jannah right here on earth, and wallahi, Allah has said we can dwell in tranquility. We can dwell in peace and tranquility because there's so much love and mercy in the home. So again, we aim for itkan and ihsan. Itkan and ihsan in everything we do. What are Allah's attributes? And never ever lose sight that you are his khalifa. Once you always remember that, to be very honest, you will never behave badly. You will never stoop down. We both then focused on building ourselves, building our strength, building our nafs, and making sure we always had good adab in how we related, good conduct. We started to read books on personal growth, on self-awareness, on emotional intelligence, on learning about our love languages, and we shared with each other. Now, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us. Inshallah, by September, we would have been married 31 years. Alhamdulillah. And when I look back at where we started and how bad and how low things got, I cannot believe what we have today. It's far more beautiful than the expectations I had of what my parents had. It's far more beautiful, far more fulfilling, far more meaningful than what we ever envisaged our marriage to be. Today, my husband meets me at the door, or if I'm the one, he's coming home, I meet him at the door. We've, made, we've created cultures that make us look forward to coming home to each other. We make sure we look presentable for each other. Even if it's a lazy Sunday and we're not going out, we still make sure we look good for one another. We still race. We play hide and seek in the house. Yes, I'm so afraid of what my neighbors think of us because the way I scream when I'm caught. But Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi did so with his wife. He was the romantic prophet. He bathed with Aisha radiallahu anha, so we know we are meant to be romantic with our spouse. He would put her on his shoulder and take her to see entertainment in a marketplace. People dancing in a marketplace. These are the examples. 
Sometimes my children will get up and leave the room when they see us loving each other and they say, this, this is no longer, it's, this is R-rated, and they leave the room for us. We show affection openly, and I swear I sometimes think our kids get jealous of us. My kids are far away, but I would actually call my son sometimes and I say, I'm calling to report your dad. I really have a problem. The love is too much. And then my son will like, Mama, I wish that were my problem in life. Too much love. Yep, he would say that and it just cracks me up. But we are teaching them how they are meant to relate with their spouse and their children. Remember, it's not what you say that sticks. It's what you do, what they see that sticks. So we pray together as a family. We let them hear what we are praying for and we take turns in making the dua. So today it's your turn to make dua and we pray, we do the dua aloud so everybody hears and we make sure they are conscious that you pray for grandma as well and grandpa and this person who is sick and the umma and your brother and your mother, everybody, they get used to hearing this is what you pray for and your own success. They hear us pray for Allah to grant them beautiful spouses, but let them be beautiful husbands and so on. We teach them to have this long, strong love for Allah and fear offending or displeasing him. We do acts of charity together, community service. Sometimes as a family, sometimes we encourage them. Your uncle is planting trees today. Go and join him and so on. We eat together as a family with no technology. Because if you look at families today, when they go out, everybody's on their devices. In the home, they're communicating. We do marriage counseling, my husband and I. And you hear a spouse complaining that my spouse speaks to me through their device and communicates with the children. Food is ready via the devices today. And they're all in the same home. This is what is happening. It's taking over our families. We make sure we have rules and etiquettes when it comes to the use of social media as well. We talk to our children from a very young age about boy-girl relationships. Sometimes they listen, trust me, many times they don't. But these days they are starting younger and younger. We talk about inappropriate physical contact with members of the same gender. Because today they are growing up in a society where bad is made to look good and good is made to look very uncool. In fact, good is made to look bad in their eyes. So we talk about that. We close mark what they do on social media when they are very young and listen to them. Listen to even the silliest things they talk about. Never ignore. The risk is if you ignore and they feel you're not giving them your undivided attention, they will seek it elsewhere because that need has to be fulfilled. I had to do research on effective communication and effective listening. That's something that was very hard for me. I wasn't a good listener. When my husband was speaking, I was already thinking of my response. So I had to learn, I had to take courses because I knew it was a problem, but I also had to learn how to communicate effectively with the children. So I realized one of the worst things with kids is don't let them feel you're judging them. So I had to learn how do I communicate effectively and when they give me an answer and I don't like the answer, I don't make them run away and next time hide it from me. So they open up, they tell me everything about what's going on in their lives. We let them see how we communicate as a couple. But one thing we promised, even before we got married, we would never do. We would never let them see us fight. After the kids came, there would be tension from time to time. But wallahi, we never let them see a fight. But we let them see us have arguments. But we made them understand, you can disagree, but don't be disagreeable. Those are all the kind of examples we made sure we taught them. That you will fight. In, as a couple, you will have disagreements, but never lose sight of your spouse's endearing qualities, which is what I told you at the beginning. Then I started to read books like The Five Love Languages for Teens and Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, which is an amazing book. And then recently, I even posted the Five Love Language quiz on our WhatsApp group, which is just the four of us, because we are just for my husband and the two boys. And we posted it so that everybody takes the test and we see what is your big number one love language, so that we are still depositing in the right currency. So those are all little things that we've done to, you know, be more intentional in the relationship. Then we let them see how we take care of our parents as they age. My children, up until my parents passed away, they would see me, I would put my head on my mother's lap, I would watch my sons who are 
like this tall, put, lie down on grandma, put her, you know, not fully, but put their head, be very physical and affectionate because they saw us doing it as well. They would see me kiss my parents. They would see me hug my parents. And they would he, watch me listen to their stories for the hundredth time. And yet I looked fully interested when I could tell the story myself. And as a team, we would discuss how to handle our aged parents. And it reached a stage where, alhamdulillah, my kids would even take turns staying with my parents. And sometimes my husband would pack the boys and they would go and stay with my parents because I've had to travel and I'm not there and they know I'm worried. So we talked about this up until Allah called them home. Wallahi alhamdulillah, we discussed all these issues and it made it so much easier. They hear me thank, they heard me thank my parents for the seeds they planted. Wallahi, up until my father took his last breath, I was privileged to be there when both passed away a year after the other. I would say, Baba, may Allah bless you. May Allah bless you, Jazakallah khairan, for everything you've done for me. And I would say, I am your witness before Allah. And that was something that was so important that I made sure the kids hear the du'as that I made for my parents. Why was this so important? is because we are teaching them how to treat us when we get old. It's such an important thing. And if your parents were one of those who made mistakes and messed up, it's important you forgive them because it will free you up and pray for Allah to forgive them. We are hopefully passing on the baton and that is what we are hoping they will do with their parents so their children see that and the generation it continues. Everything in our relationship, like I said, is meant to be balanced. Make sure you're deliberate when it comes to the time you spend with your spouse. Our children know. Number one, for me, Allah first. This is, as a person, what is my list of priorities? Number one, Allah first. My relationship with Allah, I hold on tight to Allah's rope. I make sure Allah is my compass and my personal qibla. Number two is me, myself, and I. And what do I mean by that? It's not being selfish. It's about making sure I'm in order, my mental health, that I am okay because if my battery is full, I can give you the best of me. My husband knows that, that sometimes mama needs time out, me time. Give her space. He will actually say that to the kids. Give mama space to breathe, because sometimes it gets heavy. So number two is me, myself, and I. Number three is their father, because they know that if me and their dad are in order, they'll be fine, inshallah. They come next. And then after them, it's the other loved ones, based on priorities. So it's important that we understand the ranking. Allah first then make sure you're okay, your intellectual growth, your health. There's no use being, having a beautiful home when you are crippled with, you know, some kind of debilitating disease because you didn't take care of yourself. So that me, myself and I includes your health, your body has a right over you, your physical, your mental, you know, your intellectual growth and so on. This is what I mean by that. And then fulfill your obligations to all of them, but don't neglect one for the other. One thing that is important about parenting is never lose sight of why you had your children. If you do it right, inshallah, they will add value to the home. If you don't, then they will make the home a living hell. We have parents today who want to leave the children at home and run away. Not even the kids wanting to run away. Why? Because they are brats. They are a menace. They are a fitna for them. So it's really important. They will make life and they will be a problem for you and your and societies. So we help. This is why, why I said this is because what I see going on with this generation and how we are raising our children is we help our children to live, but we don't prepare them to live without us. We do everything for them, especially we mothers. We're guilty of spoon feeding them. They don't get to learn certain ethics and certain values. They end up depending on us to do everything. And we think it's love. But many of us don't teach them values such as service, perseverance, hard work. This generation is growing up with instant results for no efforts. You just click a button and you get a result. And they don't realize marriage is hard work. Parenting is hard work. So they call it quits very easily because they don't see the instant results they wanted. They want and we give. And it's really important as parents, I emphasize, that is not love. You have to instill that proper terbiya in your child. You earn it. You don't just get it. It's not an entitlement. 
you gave birth to your children, but you didn't give birth to their character, as we come to at the end of this. It all boils down to individual choice. You may do everything in your power to plant the right seeds, give them the best tarbiyah. But remember, it all boils down to individual choice. Sometimes our children, like the prophets, various prophets had trials of their children. They make their own decisions and they choose their own path. But don't be a hardliner and don't cut them off. Even Rasulullah after the battle, when the archers left their post, Allah said, if you are harsh hearted, if you had been harsh hearted with them, they would have broken away from you. So you gotta remember, parenting is for life. The Rasulullah said, Our wealth and our children are a trial for us. So keep praying, and Allah will never ever ignore your prayers as a parent. And keep planting seed, seeds. And there is so much more. To do, but just keep doing it. Many of you are already doing a great job. Wallahi, don't stop. Inshallah, you're on track. Just like my dad would say, renew your intention and improve upon it. But make sure you're doing it together. My final words for us on how to build a home, our own Jannah in our homes, is something that my husband and I have been able to attain, alhamdulillah, after 31 years, and the children, is we tr treat our home as a thriving garden. We put a fence around it and guard it jealously by putting boundaries, making sure we monitor and we demand certain things and make sure we block certain things from interfering. But everyone is planting seeds in the relationship. Everyone is nurturing. Everyone is fertilizing. Everyone is bringing sunlight and water to the relationship. And everyone is removing weeds in this our thriving garden starting with the weeds within themselves, their own bad habits, their own negative habits. And through Allah's will, alhamdulillah, we've been able to smell the fragrance of the seeds we planted that have finally bore fruit and the fruit of our labor. And that is my prayer for each and every one of you, for those who are married and those who are yet to get married. It is my prayer that Allah will bless your homes. Allah will bless you, elevate you. May you never be found wanting. For those who are yet married, may Allah guide you to find that spouse that he created just for you. And for those who are married, may Allah strengthen the bond between the two of you. May Allah bless your children and your offspring and may they be the coolness of your eyes. And may you always, always find peace, happiness and contentment in your homes, inshallah. And may your children and your spouse be your best witnesses in the eyes of Allah. May Allah bless you all. May Allah forgive me for where I may have erred. And may Allah bless the organizers of this and this whole amazing organization for being established. And may this gathering be a witness for all of us, inshallah, in the life to come. Jazakumullah khairan. It's a pleasure. This is my first talk in Malaysia. My first time in Malaysia, inshallah. So thank you. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Any questions? Feel free. Yes. <laughs> Please ask plenty. I love questions. Yeah. Usually, what men? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, I think in yeah, all always, cultures. Uh, yeah. Always talk about haram. Yeah. Can it be? Uh, yeah, uh, for, uh, for what is uh, sunnah? Mm -hmm. But other things, they forgot about uh, being sweet. With Your wife is sunnah as well. I think it's a reality. I think all over the world. I mean, we live in a very patriarchal society, generally, where, of course, but even Allah has said the men are a degree above us. So I always say that my husband is the head of the house. He's the leader of the home, and I am going to follow him. If he is respectworthy and has a destination, I will be a willing flock, you know, as my shepherd leading me. Having said that, 
what you said is exactly on point. We have a big problem. I believe today we wear Islam like a uniform. We put it on when it's convenient, we take it off when we want to. And we nitpick the parts of the Sunnah and the verses of the Hadith, uh, of the Quran, some, many out of context, and as long as it suits us. So we can bring quotes on the tips of our tongues, but the challenge you have is, it's a whole picture we are meant to see. Look at Rasulullah as a person, as a father, in his various roles, as a husband, how as a neighbor, how he related, how he did even his da'wah. We're not supposed to say, oh, that part of what Rasulullah is only during the Jahiliya period, but not here. No, there was never a separation when it came to relationships. To say it's only, yeah. Like because we judge religion too much. It's like a robot, we already said. Exactly, Arab, exactly. Yes, exactly. Who was the first person he ran to when he got the revelation of the Quran? Uh, the wife. Khadija, radiallahu anha. He went to his wife. When he was taking his last breath, where, whose head was he lying on top of? You know, whose lap was he lying on? But where is that when the preachers are preaching, you know, about how, you know, like this was the most important thing. It was his spouse, his relationship, you know. He was praying with the Sahaba. He went into sujood and he stayed for a long time. And after they finished the prayer, the Sahaba was thinking he was having a revelation. So they asked, were you having a revelation? He said, no, my God, grandchildren were playing on my back. Where, what happened to those stories, you know? And the romantic prophet, and you know, the, the most wonderful father. What happened to all those? Of course. Exactly. It's not about cherry picking. Yeah. Islam is about just looking at the example, the Sunnah way. I say we are so good at the Sunnah look, but we don't have the Sunnah way. That is one of the biggest things we are very deficient in. And we can't play with the religion where, when it suits us, we wear the uniform. And then we lie, we gossip, we envy, we do all those things. And then we come, oh, haram, you're not dressed properly, sister. And like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Even Rasulullah wasn't so judgmental in condemning people in such way. That's not how you behave. And many are leaving Islam because of that, subhanAllah, you're going to burn in hell behavior that many of us do. Haram, you're not Muslim enough. My mother embraced Islam. She's a British citizen. She was born. She's a British citizen, and um, she embraced Islam. Well, funny enough, she was ch studying Chinese in the UK at SOAS, and she didn't cover herself until she got married. She came to Nigeria, she married my dad, and um, it wasn't until she went for Hajj that she finally decided she would start covering one by one. But my mother is the same person who as she started adding the layers, you know, the hijab slowly getting longer and longer, she's the same person who wrote books on Islam. The national textbook that's used in the secondary schools in Nigeria and in West Africa were written by my mom. She wrote books on understanding Arabic. She wrote books on fiqh, on sirah. She wrote about 27 published books that, you know, international books that have been made. She established the best Islamic secondary school in Africa. That's where I work in the college. I'm the head of admin as well as head of HR. So she established that school. She established FOMWAN, the Federation of Muslim Women's Association of Nigeria, and she traveled around Africa to spread FOMWAN, to have other Muslim women groups come together so that they strengthen numbers. And Today, Form 1, they have schools, they're about to open a university, they have hospitals, they have orphanages. They, the impact, and you say this is one person. If you judge people and condemn them and they feel, no, this Islam is too strict, you could lose an opportunity to do the, you could chase people away. When in Islam, we're meant to encourage people to Islam with beautiful preaching. If people are like psychology. Exactly. Exactly. So I think this thing you mentioned is so true. We need to just make sure we work on ourselves, like Umar radiallahu anha said, and who said, call yourself to account before Allah calls you to be account. Don't be busy judging other people and taking the role of God. You work on you. Yes, you can encourage, but don't force. There's no compulsion in religion. So we have to be very careful in how we 
you know, address these issues, how we preach and what example we're setting for our children. Many Muslim homes are losing this generation because, sorry, because of the extreme, the hard line. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's the reality. May Allah make it easy. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. Any questions related to what we've said? Yes, sister. knowledge or a degree or yes, something yes, yes. yeah superiority yeah On the rocks, yeah. Better than you or higher than you? Very good question. You know, I mentioned this thing where in marriages today, the reality is you have people where there's su spiritual superiority, intellectual superiority, financial superiority. This is what goes on in the home. We literally counsel the couple who is like, you know, she keeps showing off that she comes from this family. Even my family, we have this, this. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, what is this pettiness in a relationship? However, I think I often say marry your best friend. Start off as best friends. It's important. When you know you can flow, you can talk, you can laugh, you... You, because Allah said, you know, um, we made you into nations. And uh, let me see, how does that go? Um, we have created for you mates. When I ask you who is your mate, what comes to mind? You sometimes think your schoolmate or your classmate or, you know, mate. We have created for you a companion, a buddy, somebody who, you know, you grow together, not someone who is meant to lord over you. The problem we have today, and I think it's more this feminist movement, where a lot of women have climbed up the ladder and have become more economically stronger. And then they are listening to this jargon about women's rights and women entitled, you know, and they feel we should be equal. I said, no, but Allah didn't say we are equal. So if you can always maintain the respect that your husband is the head of the home and you remove those thoughts of, you know, whether my bank account is fuller, doesn't make me a better person, doesn't make me a better wife. And for me, that's the first thing that Allah will judge me by, not what was in my account. So this has a lot to do with the nafs. This has a lot to do with the self-awareness. Wallahi, I was earning far more than my husband at one point. When we got married, we moved to America. He lived there for 22 years. And when we got married, literally the next day, he whisked me off to the States. And I got bored. I was like, look, I can't sit. I need to work. I started climbing up the ladder. There was a point I was managing four offices as an executive headhunter. I was earning a heck of a lot of money, but wallahi, never once. And my husband was the one who always said, when I, would, when I would doubt myself, I wanted to apply for the job. He's like, give it a shot. What have you got to lose? Even if they say no, at least you've got the experience. And he was always there. How will I now disrespect him? and make him feel he's less than me when it is with his consent that I was able to do it and his support. So I think a lot has to do with the individual, their level of self-awareness, their level of maturity and their level of humility, which if Allah is first, then most likely they won't have those kind of attributes. If they are a khalifa of Allah, then pride and arrogance will not feature in their personality. So for me, those are amongst the things that I believe strongly we need to work on ourselves first. Be in order, be the right person. Then 
those things. It, it, in fact, funny enough, my son was asking me when we were coming over, um, and he said, what would you say are the two, uh, what are the, what's the best advice you would give someone to make them likable? That was the question he asked me, and I said, humility and gratitude. And I think those are two things that I know help one go far in life. I said, if you're humble, no matter what you have, no matter how much you have, you're always humble, then you find it's an endearing quality. People will be attracted to you. And also, if you're grateful. And for me, I know I'm constantly, constantly, constantly grateful. Like the moment, um, it was my son who opened a YouTube channel for me and like these lectures you give, open it out to the world. Only few people get to hear, but you can open it. And so that's how, as they see, the rest is history. I've been doing this for about 10 years now, traveling the world, giving talks and so on. And now we go out. Everybody was like, Mariam Limbo, and my husband is standing next to me. And he's like, I'm so proud of you. Like, there's no fe you know, feeling of envy or anything, you know, because it's, and for me, the first thing I do to people, I was like, this is my husband, you know, because for me, he's my backbone. He supported me. This is my pillar, what allows me to be strong, you know, and do what I'm doing. Without his consent, even under Sharia, I can't do it if he doesn't approve. So I think it's about really the mindset. Yeah, sorry for the long explanation. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, sir. The era of what? Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. Something yeah, dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Because same thing with the right. Mm. So the problem with the, I mean, with all the models, huh? all the, I mean, I mean, you know, you, you can even read uh, in the paper, in the, in the news, or in the, in the world, or even in any, any, I mean, any of the social media. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I so appreciate what you raised, because I have even a topic I present on the use of social media in the homes. And like I said, when our kids were growing up, we made sure we close-marked what they were exposed to. But today, it's even worse than then, when they were younger. And unfortunately, it's not even about women and mothers. Wallahi, it is couples. It's, bo it's affecting both. Where they are addicted to social media, they are giving the unseen more priority than the ones that they would want by their deathbeds if they were taking their last breath. And you would find a guy is lying in bed next to his wife and he's chatting with a total stranger at two in the morning. And I asked people, I said, in reality, would this woman be able to knock on your door, open the door, your wife is in the house and you will allow her in? I said, but that's what you're doing with this phone. This is like having an affair. Doesn't mean it has to be physical. Zina can be with the eyes. 
then I can be with the tongue. It doesn't have to be a physical, intimate relationship. But we are violating our marital vows by allowing things that are not appropriate into our religious cultures and religious values. So the issue to do with the question you raised is for me to tell people, again, you both have to be committed. If your child has access to devices, it takes both couples to say, that's not what I want for my children. So what are your goals for your children? And make sure you set boundaries and make sure you make it clear and have a discussion. These are the effects, so please let's agree we're not going to. It's the most convenient babysitter. So I know mothers can be guilty of just allowing because it gives her a break. But again, it can be a tool that is used for something positive, but it can also be very dangerous. And so one has to be very conscious. The good thing about the digital age is there are firewalls, there are ways you can block what your children have access to. And there are ways you can set up devices so you are alerted if they go out of. But kids are also getting smarter and wiser and are finding ways to bypass all these things. So parents are in a lot of trouble and the umma is in a lot of trouble. But again, if you plant the right seeds and values and talk to your children a lot and immunize them because they will always be exposed to fitina. They don't need to see it on their devices. If they walk out of their houses, they will see it. So it's how do you immunize them with the right tools to make sure they do not succumb to what the reality of this day is that we live in. But I, I really appreciate your contribution, absolutely. Any other questions? I think we've used up our time. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yes. Sorry? There is something, sorry, I missed that. Yes. He doesn't know? He ignores, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good question. When is it that you say, you know, I've used up my patience, I can't take it anymore because they are refusing to change? I often ask people first, you try all means, try all options till you've exhausted them. Where I say the limit is, is where you are being broken. You're depleting in value. Of course, that is like the last thing. Allah detests it, but he has opened the door for it. If what you are hoping to achieve in a relationship, you are not getting. On the contrary, you're being devalued from what you were when you were in your parents' home, then there is a problem. You need intervention. So when I say exhaust all options, you bring in some people who are respected by both parties and are discreet, who will be very confidential but very wise in what kind of counsel. Sometimes I know some people will call the wali to come in. Sometimes it's relatives they call in. Sometimes it's somebody highly respected in society that that person respects that they call in to say, there is a problem. Your spouse is complaining about this. They say they've tried this, they've tried that, there's no improvement. We need to talk. There has to be some kind of a change. But I often say when it gets to abuse, that's where you draw the line. Physical. What's that? If the, yes, if the person is becoming abusive physically, where literally, even psychological abuse is it's deadly. It pushes people to suicide. So if you find there is abuse that is depleting you, mentally destabilizing you, you need to do your istihara and ask Allah to guide you to make the best decision. Because sometimes mothers in particular make the biggest mistake. They stay in the marriage that is toxic because of their children. But again, your children are your witnesses. Is that the example you want them to see? That this is how a wife is meant to be treated or you are the one abusive to your spouse and your spouse feels, you know what, this, we cannot continue like this because them being a witness to this is worse. So I remember a case where the wife asked for a divorce from the husband and the husband saw the relationship was getting very toxic and it broke his heart because under Sharia she gets the children and she was poisoned. But it's Sharia, he had to respect the rules and so on. But he said, you know what, I would rather they don't grow up because they were boys, they don't grow up seeing me unhappy. They don't grow up seeing us quarrel and fight. So divorce seemed to be the only option. They did their istihara, they did the divorce, 
And Wallahi Allah, in his mercy, she was the first because the kids were getting un out of, she couldn't handle them as a single mom. She brought them back and gave them to the father. Allah has his own way of doing things. But it's one of those things where I say you fight, you fight to make your marriage work till you exhaust all options. So you try, don't give up easily. If I gave up, which I almost did in our sixth year of marriage, we wouldn't be able to talk about this 31 years later. Alhamdulillah is all I say for that. So there is always hope, there is always light, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I'm sure this will be the first of many opportunities for us to meet again. And there are so many other things we can talk about, inshallah, in the future. May Allah bless you. Thank you for your time. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.